Hello, uh, recording a brief video for section test number two uh, on uh, Emmanuel Kant and John Stuart Mill. These are your books. Um, it, recall that it's two books with Mill and one with Kant. Um, and uh, you are responsible here for um, all of the video material posted to Moodle uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the, the readings as well. Right. Um, and lectures if you're in my on-campus class. Uh, these are short answer questions. Uh, it's exactly the same as the previous test, um, so there's a lot of boilerplate here. Um, discussion of what a section test is, um, the missed assignment policy, essentially that um, extensions require a conversation. Um, assignment submission, make sure you get me the complete document, the right document, and the document. Right? I, I can only create what I get. And um, if you're using um, sources, and if you're quoting something or referring to something, give me a reference so that I can go find it. This is, this is an academic integrity issue. Um, it, you don't want to be caught uh, you, 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 taking credit for somebody else's claims or statements or words, right? So um, it, just be sure you are above board on that. Uh, so what I've done here is I've given you uh, two questions on Kant and two questions on Mill, five points each for a total of 20 points. Uh, what I'm looking for is a minimum of two paragraphs in terms of a response. If you don't give me two paragraphs, which I define here, um, then uh, you've not met the minimum requirements and you can't receive a passing grade um, for the question. So make sure, make sure you exhaust these questions as you're responding to them. Um, so uh, I'm just very quickly going to go over the Kant questions and the Mill questions um, for, uh, for, for these, these, um, uh, these, these um, the, 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 the assignment. I'm having trouble speaking today, I guess. Um, uh, the first question, in his discussion of the first formulation of the categorical imperative, which reads, act only according to that maxim, whereby you can at the same time will that it should be universal law. Kant draws a distinction between perfect and imperfect duties. Introduce the distinction between perfect and imperfect duties, illustrating with examples. Um, it, luckily here, Kant gives you four examples. Um, I really only need, and he's trying to distinguish between perfect duties to yourself, perfect duties to others, perfect duties, or imperfect duties to yourself, and imperfect duties to others, right? That's what he's trying to do here. Um, what I want to see here is the mechanism by which we determine um, a perfect duty as distinct from an imperfect duty, right? And I discussed that in my video material and in class as a perfect duty stems from reason um, and an imperfect duty stems from the will, right? So um, feel free to use Kant's examples here. Um, they are suicide and um, the false promise um, for perfect duties, um, developing your talents and uh, beneficence for imperfect duties, um, and you should have plenty to get you to two paragraphs uh, in uh, what, what we've discussed here. Um, so show me how to apply the first formulation of the categorical imperative and make the distinction between perfect and imperfect duties for that question. Okay, Can't, um, uh, question um, uh, the second one. Kant introduces the humanity principle, quote, act in such a way that you treat humanity, whether in your own person or the person of another, always as an end in itself and nearly, never merely as a means. He introduces this principle as another formulation of the categorical imperative. This principle, he argues, rests on the dignity of human beings. He argues that human beings are, quote, objects of respect. Uh, that's on your page 36. Why are human beings, according to Kant, quote, objects of respect? Right, that's the first question. Now, um, his, his terminology, objects of respect, is kind of, um, it's weird, right? It's caught people up in the past. So I've, I feel I have to um, it, it point out to you, uh, you know, really what he's doing is defining 
an objective end. Right? Thus, he uses the term objects, but he argues that human beings are persons because we are autonomous and can act as the basis for another formulation of the categorical imperative. Don't, don't get caught up on the word object. Right? Um, I've had students fall into that hole um, in the past. So why are human beings persons with dignity and that sort of thing? Right? And the second part of the question is how does this position follow naturally, as Kant argues it does, from the first formulation of the categorical imperative? Right? Kant argues because we can act according to that maxim whereby we can at the same time will it to be universal law that the second formulation that we should treat humanity whether in our own person or the person of another always is an end in itself and never merely as a means. These things are so many different ways of saying the same thing. One follows directly from the other. Basically what I want you to do is spell it out, right? Why really we have dignity and can be ends in ourselves, and two, how this provides the basis for a second formulation of the categorical imperative, namely the humanity principle. All right, so hopefully that's nice and clear. Um, organize your answer because it's it, it, for Kant, it's easy to get muddled in these responses. So um, it, read it over and make sure it makes sense before you submit. Um, now on to Mill. Um, Mill introduces the notion of political liberty in his own liberty to address a specific uh, criticism of the principle of utility related to individual human rights, which was introduced by Michael Sandel in his Justice episode 2 posted to Moodle. Introduce the notion of political liberty advanced by Mill and discuss how this notion might respond to the criticism introduced by Sandel. Right. That's what you're doing. So, uh, what does John Stuart Mill mean by liberty? Right. Um, political liberty. Right. And how does it respond to um, that criticism uh, raised by, I think her name was Anna in um, the, the, the Sandel video? Um, the, the criticism that, that utility fails to respect individual the rights of the individual, right? So, um, how does liberty address that criticism? That's the question. Uh, that should be fairly straightforward, right? Um, okay, now the final question. Um, I threw you a bit of a uh, curveball. I asked you a Roderick question here. Rick Roderick, in his video, Kant in the Path of Enlightenment, he also makes it in the Mill on Liberty video, uh, the same claim, makes the following claim uh, regarding both Kantian and utilitarian morality. He repeats the claim in both videos, right? But this is from the Kant video here. He claims, in fact, these two moral theories, in terms of just pure moral theories, still dominate the standard philosophical discussion. Now, it's clear to me that one of them is more interesting than the other, I think you know which one um, is more interesting to me. Crowd laughter, it's the Kant video that we're getting this from, of course. But I've got to warn you that there are knockdown objections to both. And by knockdown objections, I mean knockdown objections. We know that these theories are wrong because there are knockdown objections to them. The best way to look at both of them, however, might be as models of moral option, uh, action, if by models we don't just mean a shop, uh, the shopping uh, mart idea of something, we do once in a while, but as a way to think about moral life if you're interested in it. Right. I discussed this a bit with you, um, but the question here is what does Roderick mean by calling these moral theories models of moral action? Right? These, these are theoretical models to see the way that moral decision-making works if, for example, we apply an end-oriented method right, versus how it looks if we apply a deed-oriented kind of method of thinking about moral theory. So your job is to flesh out that argument um, with regard to why 
uh, Roderick calls these models of moral action. And then I want you to do something, right? Um, so your first paragraph is explaining that, right? Your second paragraph is going to be you making an argument. It would seem that either Roderick is right or he's wrong. In either case, it would come down to making an argument. So what you are going to do, supporting your position with an argument, one that makes use of your understanding of the material studied in this course, how would you respond to this assessment of Kantian and utilitarian morality? Right. So by calling these theories models, I mean effectively what Roderick is claiming is really in a really practical lived sense, there shouldn't be utilitarians and there shouldn't be Kantians. These are just ways of thinking about moral action and not practical and applicable moral systems, right? Because there are these knock down objections to them, right? So, uh, I mean, effectively, right, what Roderick is cr claiming is that these give us a theoretical guide, but not a practical guide that helps us live our life. Now, ways to respond to that criticism might be that, well, yeah, Roderick is right, right? Sometimes intentions and the deed itself should be evaluated, and sometimes outcomes should be evaluated. Roderick is right, and these are both great ways of helping us think through the full theoretical underpinnings of what it means to think about consequences or deeds themselves. You could agree with Roderick. You could disagree with Roderick and say, no, Kant's um, grounding to metaphysical morals presents us with a whole host of practical sort of principles that we should base our life on. We shouldn't be utilitarians. We shouldn't just treat these as models. In fact, no, we should be Kantians and act only according to that maxim, whereby we can will it to be universal law, at the same time will it to be universal law, and treat humanity, whether in our own person or the person of another, always as an end and never merely as means. Right? We should be Kantians. That's another way to respond to it. Right? Yet another way to respond to this question might be that, no, Kant is problematic and idealistic and et cetera, et cetera, like whatever criticism you want to make of Kant and claim that, you know, in real honest to goodness practical terms, utilitarianism works. It works. It's the way we make our decisions. It's the way we have to make practical decisions in the world, right? So Roderick is wrong. These aren't just models. At least one of these systems is a practical moral, moral system. Now, since they conflict with one another, right, the final way to respond to this question would be the hardest of all to actually argue, right? Roderick is wrong, and these are both practical models for living our lives, right? But since utilitarianism and Kantian morality conflict with one another, in order to make that case, you would have to somehow demonstrate that these moral theories are somehow compatible with one another, right? That's the hardest way to answer this question. So, um, effectively, what I want you to do is pick a position. Roderick is right. No, there should be Kantians. No, there should be utilitarians. And Roderick is wrong in those two options. Or Roderick is wrong and both Kant and Mill are right, somehow. Right? So, effectively, what I want you to do and this is the point we've reached in this course where you should be making an argument, right? You should be engaging with an analysis of the theory, taking a position and arguing it, right? Um, so that's, that's going to be what you do in the final question here. Um, and in your response, I should get some sort of notion of what utilitarianism or Kantian morality are generally, right? That makes sense. Uh, so the assessment criteria is same as the last time. Um, you're going to be graded for the clarity of your response, like do I know what the heck you're arguing? Um, it, are you being ambiguous? Are you making explicit claims? Or are you only implying what you're talking about? It's best to be explicit. Um, completeness. Did you just miss a part of the question um, or an important aspect of the theory that's relevant and important to responding to the question? 
your understanding exhibited and your use of the course material. Right. Um, that, so, do you, did you get it right? right? Um, is your assessment of utilitarian or Kantian morality accurate to Kant or Mill? Right. And then finally, um, the strength of the argument or insight into the material at question, um, it, 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 the, which will directly be applicable to the final question. But I've noticed a number of you have been presenting me with arguments all along. So, that's. That's, that's good philosophical stuff. Anyhow, um, I look forward to uh, reading your assignments. Uh, like I say, it's due March 12th at noon. Um, I've given you a full week with this material. Um, use your time. Use your time. I, I noticed a few of your assignments on the last one. Um, well, it, what happened? It looked like you gave me great responses to the first two, a mediocre response to the third, and a very, very quick summation of the fourth. You ran out of time. That's what you did. That's why I give you a full week with this material, with your notes, with the videos, with time to think about the questions and that sort of thing. In philosophy, it's not the quick answer that's best. It's the substantial answer that's best. Right? I want you to give a well thought out, well argued sort of response to these questions and save yourself some time to proofread. Catch your own ambiguities, um, catch your contradictions. I do this when I write as well. Before I submit anything, I give it some space and then I read it over. I might even have somebody else read it over and give me their comments. Right. So, I, so use your time. Use your time, it will help you. All right, um, if you have any questions, uh, I have office hours today um, and will be answering emails. All right, thanks, have good days, one for each of you.